now that we explained urban form, where different groups live and how that's changed over time, and the legacies of all these different models, let's look at a key pattern, something that we identify, and that's something called residential segregation. Another way to think of this term is residential separation, as what happens is with via segregation, we get the different groups, different income groups, as we've showcased, different racial groups, uh, which we'll definitely see here in a minute, uh, but also different groups based on religion and ethnicity. Now, we don't see as much religion uh, here in the United States, in particular Indianapolis, but go to Belfast in Northern Ireland. You'll have the Catholics and the Protestants, and you'll see there, there's definitely residential segregation based on one's religion, whether or not they're Catholic or they're Protestant. So one of the things we're just going to see, residential segregation, it's not something that's just apparent here in Indianapolis. It's found all throughout the world. It just varies from place to place. Now let's get some fact-based insights. Let's actually use some data, some geographic data, to ask ourselves, are different ethnic groups or racial groups separated into residential groupings or residential separation in Indianapolis? And to do this, we're going to look at some census maps. First group, African Americans or blacks. Uh, so here we can see a pattern. If we look at the yellow star, that's the Central Business District. We can see 465. But what we have here is definitely a pattern in which north of downtown to the north and to the west and north and to the east, we can see a large population of African Americans. Uh, so we can see in this case uh, a particular pattern of residential separation. In the case of Hispanics, you see a pattern in which they're more uh, found on the near west side. So in the areas around Washington Street on the near west side, but also around Speedway. Asians are a little bit more dispersed. You find some clusters in Hamilton County, but also in southern Marion County uh, and northern uh, Johnson County. And I'll end this video with some key terms. And so one of the patterns we definitely have observed is something called spatial mismatch. So earlier on in those previous models, I tried to emphasize the fact that low-income jobs were close to low-income workers. Increasingly, what's happening is more and more jobs are moving to suburban areas. Industrial parks are moving to suburban areas. Warehouses, retail, commercial, all types of jobs are moving farther away from low-income individuals who live closer to the central business district in what we call the inner suburbs or the inner city areas of Indianapolis. And so what's happening is they have to travel farther or there's less accessibility to reach job opportunities found increasingly in suburban areas. That's a problem because they also uh, aren't, you know, we don't see transportation networks, we don't see public transportation opportunities linking uh, from those low income areas to uh, more suburban areas. And so then what happens is they have to rely on a vehicle. Um, so that adds another cost. And so when we think about low-income individuals, not only the burden by the fact that, that jobs are moving farther from them, uh, but also that's even increasingly an issue uh, because they don't have the means to get uh, to said job. And so some of the people who've come up with good ideas uh, have, have actually tried to relocate their businesses in areas in these inner suburbs, in these inner city areas, these closer a these areas inside 465, uh, by investing in these communities, by building uh, a particular uh, grocery store or p building a shopping area, uh, trying to increase uh, investment in particular areas to uh, provide job opportunities and more diverse job opportunities uh, for these lower income individuals and uh, those previous earlier models I mentioned beforehand, those earlier, you know, the, the zone uh, two and three mentioned the concentric green and sector model, uh, but also when we think about the urban realms, the less desirable urban realms where there's less amenities. We try to understand how do we have residential separation. There's many reasons. You know, first off, there's chain migration. People want to live with people who are similar to them. There's no doubt that that plays a key role there. But another thing is we definitely have examples of housing discrimination that over time, uh, different examples of it that over time has also added to the residential separation we see in cities today. The first one being called redlining, which is a practice you don't see as much today, and it's actually not something that people would ever want to publicize that they do, uh, but it was actually something that was very common in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, so essentially what happened was uh, if you were trying to get a loan, uh, you go to the bank, uh, and what the bank would do is they would have a map uh, they would draw a red line around areas in which anybody from that area, 
on that map came into their office looking for a loan, they would say, nope, not going to happen. Uh, so that's essentially redlining. And so it's a practice of denying services, uh, denying, for example, the opportunity to get a loan uh, for people from certain areas. Um, so that's going to further restrict people having the opportunity to move to new areas. Um, so redlining is a, is a pattern in which it was actually named after just drawing a red line on a map saying, nope, no services for you. Uh, so this is a pattern that we don't see, of course, we don't see maps in the walls of businesses today with red lines. But it is something that kind of happens in a, in a very, very uh, more casual, uh, less, uh, less public way. Another example of a housing discrimination practice is something called steering. So let's say hypothetically someone comes into me, the real estate person's office, and they want to move into this nice new neighborhood in which I've got a lot of homes and properties in. Uh, so this person, eh, let's say they're a purple person, and we don't know, we don't know, you know we're kind of you know, a little, little iffy on those purple people. Um, so what you'll do is you'll essentially you'll steer them. You'll say, you know what? Yeah, welcome to Indianapolis. Great to have you. You know, a place that you actually might rather live is somewhere over here. Um, so essentially you steer them away to an area in which you might perceive it to be uh, where they want to live, but more you're wanting to make sure they don't move into your nice protected area in which you've got a lot of developments and you want to make sure you make as much money as possible. So essentially this is an example of steering another housing discriminatory practice that once again adds to the reasons why we have residential separation. Now kind of the inverse of this, where previously the realtor would steer someone away, in the case of blockbusting, they actually encourage people to move to an area. And the moral of the story here is if you have a new development, a new subdivision, you're a realtor, you want to sell new homes, especially more expensive homes, uh, what you'll do is you'll encourage, let's say, the purple people to move into an old neighborhood. And what's going to happen is the green people are going to be like, uh-oh, the neighborhood's going to hell. we got to move somewhere else. The realtor says, aha, I know exactly where you should move. i got these new homes out in the sub suburban areas, these new subdivisions. Why don't you come out here? Uh, well, there's plenty of green people out here, and there's no purple people to have to deal with. And so essentially you encourage a housing separation, or sorry, discrimination, uh, by having you know the purple people, a, a less desirable group, let's say, uh, you know, move into an area so that then it's going to trigger an out-migration. So you essentially use fear uh, to create a situation where people want to move outward, and thus the realtor not only makes money from uh, the purple people moving into a, a said or older subdivision, but also the green people moving out, they make money from those new homes.